So we've talked about IP, what it is, how you get it, how long it lasts, etc. We've talked about the manner in which you uh, acquire rights to it, which is usually through a con contract. Before we jump tomorrow into actually looking at contracts, we we'll talk about a couple more things. One is why you would either become a licensor or a licensee of intellectual property. So some of these things that our clients ask us uh, are tough to get, get your arms around, right? Like, why would I license out my intellectual property? Why would I license in someone else's intellectual property? Uh, another thing that it's, it's hard to get one's arms around is how, how do you value intellectual property? In my practice, a lot of times clients will come to me and say, oh, I'm thinking about, this hack actually happened just last week. The client said, you know, I have only one trademark and it's basically a small business, but it's gotten to the point where other people who want to be in the same kind of business have come to my client and said, I want to open, it's a, it's a gym, right? It's a gym called Monster Garage. I won't, I won't try and hide it from you. Um, and I'll show you quickly. Uh, it's easier. Yeah, it's, and you might find it humorous too. So this is it. Uh, it's a powerlifting gym. Um, and it's just two locations in Illinois currently, but for this kind of thing, not my thing, but for the people who like to do this, it's become a name brand. So this client came to me and said, I've got people who want to license my trademark. How much should I charge? What's, what's a good royalty rate? What's, a, what's a, the right amount for an advance against royalties? Uh, or if I'm not going to do a royalty, like a percentage of income, how much should I charge? Flat fee per month. As lawyers, it's very tough for us to address those questions, right? In a, in a IP licensing practice like I have, my answer historically would have been, I don't know, that's a blank. I draft the license agreement, and in the agreement, there's a blank for how much money. You fill in the blank. I don't fill in the blank. But to the point I made earlier about if you can associate revenue with your name, uh, you can make yourself indispensable and less likely to get fired. To the same extent, if you can answer business questions like this for your client or help them to answer the business questions, you can become more valuable. So we'll get to valuation later in the course, but right now let's talk about motivations. So um, why would Give me a reason why a licensor uh, would license out its intellectual property or why a licensee might take a license. What's one reason? Money. Money. Okay. Okay, so let's, that's good enough. Fair enough. Income. If I'm a licensor, <laughs> excuse me, I want to generate income. But also, not to not invest in. Huh? But also, um, not to invest in uh, to cut the. The spendings. Okay. Because if you want to open four, three, four, five, six, I don't know how much the other things for example, you yeah. can if we stick some amount of money consumers. Yeah. yeah, if we stick with this example, it costs money to buy all this equipment, so I can license it out and make money without having to buy more yeah. weights. Yeah. Okay. Um, fair enough. And so financial motivation is one motivation. What's another motivation? Spreading What's your ideas. Expanding the brand. What's that? Spreading your ideas. Spreading your, your ideas or your knowledge or your brand. Yeah, exactly. Right? So I would call that the marketing motivation, right? I want to, you know, one might call it, if, if I want evangelists out there. I want people to spread the word of Joe, yeah. right? Um, so, and, and, you know, in these various motivations, they're not mutually exclusive, right? So. I might license my mark to you to spread my brand. So let's take this example still. Boy, it would be cool to have a Monster Garage gym, not only in Illinois, but also in Wisconsin. <coughs> that would make my gym more valuable. Yeah. More people want to come do, do business with me. So that's the marketing motivation. But at the same time, he's going to make some money from it. So he's got a little bit of financial motivation too. And one might also license out intellectual property for a strategic motivation. Any ideas what I mean by strategic motivation? 
I'm not trying to spread my brand or evangelize. I'm not trying to make money. I'm just trying to, for some other business strategy, what might it be? Okay, yeah. So let's say, you know, let's say I make ice cream, right? I have a proprietary method of making ice cream. And it's great, but it melts, right? So for a strategic purpose to expand into a new market, I'm here. I want to sell my ice cream there. I want people to consume my ice cream there. So I'll license out to somebody who makes ice cream there and has trucks. Okay, that's a st strategic reason. <coughs> so let's talk about these things in order. Let's talk about the marketing motivation, right? Um, I mentioned to you that I used to work for World Wrestling Entertainment, professional wrestling. And um, it licenses out its intellectual property for all these reasons. But where the marketing motivation is concerned, you can buy pretty much anything with the WWE brand on it. You can buy, of course, t-shirts, action figures, coffee mugs, dog beds. You can even buy a WWE coffin if you want. If you want to be buried in a WWE coffin, they'll sell you one with the big logo on the, on the roof. Like Top. Undertaker. <laughs> like Undertaker, yeah. They'll sell you a coffin. And they have, and you can do that anywhere around the world. I'm sure if I got on uh, some e-commerce site here in Athens, I could order something WWE and they would ship it to me. Do you have Amazon? Don't tell me. You've got to have Amazon. Is that all you use is Amazon, like us in the United States? No, no. we use AliExpress. It's cheaper. Really? What's it called? AliExpress. I can't do it. Well, that's awesome. Because I think like it's China's Amazon. <laughs> okay. I think uh, China's but they're cheaper. And it works perfectly. Okay. Like everywhere in the world, there's Starbucks, right? Yeah. And when I taught this course in Ukraine, I said Starbucks, blah blah blah. They they didn't know what Starbucks was. There are Starbucks here, right? Yeah. In, 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 in Ukraine. Ukraine? Yes. yes. That's not filming. In Albania. Not in Albania. Why not? Don't film like everyone else. Oh where, you get your where do you get your coffee? A little neighbor home, shop? Homemade. Homemade. Homemade coffee. Homemade oh, 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 coffee. Yeah. 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 That's what they said in Ukraine too. I said, you don't, you don't have Starbucks here. Why don't you have Starbucks? And their answer was just, it's Ukraine. We wouldn't drink Starbucks. We drink, you know, homemade drip coffee. So, or a special moment for you. Yeah. So. I'm glad when one of these pervasive American brands like Starbucks hasn't penetrated someplace and sounds like Amazon hasn't penetrated where you guys live. So that's great for me. But from the marketing perspective, you can get anything you want from WWE. And they do that through licenses, right? They don't want to be in the process of having a warehouse full of dog beds or in the business of having a warehouse full of dog beds in Greece. So they get someone else to do it. And they license out the trademarks. And they have a marketing motivation in doing that. In every consumer products license of the WWE brands for whatever, coffee, dog beds, t-shirts, the contract says that the licensee has to spend 2% of the gross revenue on marketing and advertising, right? So you bring in a $100 licensee, I get my royalty, <coughs> I've got my financial motivation, but you're gonna spend $2 out of every 100 on advertising. And what does that do? Well, it helps them sell more dog beds for sure, but it also, drives my brand. It causes more people, more eyeballs to see WWE or Undertaker or whatever it is. And therefore, they might be more likely to watch the television show or buy a pay-per-view event. So my license has a marketing motivation because I'm requiring that licensee to advertise my brand so my business is more successful. Okay, That's a marketing motivation. <coughs> um, Another marketing motivation to license a brand is to keep a product top of mind. So in the United States, I'm going to tell you something that always happens in the United States. I'm curious to see if it happens where you live. I go into a restaurant. I want a cola drink. I say, may I have a Coke? Okay. And the response oftentimes, half the time is, we don't have Coke. Is Pepsi okay? Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. Yes. That yes. yes. That's Number one, 
it's because the restaurant wants happy customers, but not really. That's a very small reason of why they say that. Why do they say it? Because there are competing intellectual property interests. On the one hand, if I'm selling uh, Pepsi, uh, I want my brand to be top of consumers' minds. So in my license agreement for the syrup to make that soda, it says you can only have this syrup if every time asked for a Coke, you say, no, we have Pepsi, is that okay? <laughs> so it's an IP reason. It's also good for Coca-Cola, by the way. Why is it good for Coca-Cola? If you go into a restaurant and ask for Coke and they correct you and say, we have Pepsi, is that okay? That's good for Coke, why? Yeah. Say, no, no, I just drink Coke. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe. But no, it's, it's the same, same product. product. <laughs> What's that? It's not the same Pepsi. product. It's not the same product, but it's still in Coca Cola. It, it, it's there because uh, some of you take Pepsi, they don't see the difference with Coca Cola. Mm. No. Who thinks they can tell the difference between Pepsi and Coke? I can't. I can't, though. No. It's good because it's because like standard for quality. Okay. They keep repeating it to you. What'd you say? I can't hear you. If there are too many people who come to you and ask, hey, do you have a call? And you will start thinking, hmm, maybe I should tell <coughs> <coughs> Maybe, okay. Yeah, those are all good reasons. The reason I'm thinking that it's good for coke is be Very what? Uh, that is same similar drink, so. Why is that good for Coke? It sells Okay. They make you know there's a distinction. So the reason I was thinking of that why it's good for Coke is because something we talked about this morning or earlier today. They don't want their mark to become generic. If everybody refers to all cola drinks as Coke, and Coke allows that to happen, their mark can become generic and they won't be able to protect it anymore. So that's why it's good for them. But really the reason you hear that in restaurants is because of the license agreement from Pepsi. All right? And that's a marketing motivation. Pepsi's licensing that mark along with the syrup and as a part of that license, they have this marketing motivation like, no, we're going to correct every consumer that asks for Coke. No, we have Pepsi. Um, another marketing motivation to license the mark is for a brand that needs to improve its image. Right? Let's say I have a brand that's fallen out of favor. I'm going to give you some examples from the US. My guess is you're not going to know what they are. People abroad typically don't know what they are. But maybe this will help you to give to to give us some examples from where you practice that fall into the same category. BMW. Well, you have this brand here. Obviously, it's a European brand. But I maybe maybe ten years ago now I bought a BMW, and when I sat down at the dealer to sign the papers, they gave me all the papers for buying the car, and then they said, oh, you want a credit card too? And they gave me another piece of paper and signed, okay, sure, I'll take the credit card too, that's fine. Um, but this is an example of a marketing motivation to me. Why? BMW is not in the business, it's not a bank. They make cars. Uh, and they might have had some financial motivation for this. By using this, they probably get a little sliver of money from the use of the card. But really, it's a marketing motivation. Why do you think I call it a marketing motivation? How does this market for BMW? It incentivizes you. It incentivizes the holder of the card to do what? No, no, no. It licenses the mark. That's yeah, license the mark. Why, why is it a marketing motivation? What marketing benefit do they get out of this card? Because it's card more user, lucrative. card holder that will use it. What's that? The card holder that will use it. It is the financial more institution behind that. The card holder that will use it what? He what will, about them? You will show in different businesses in different sectors that yes. have nothing to do with the automobile. Right. How come Every this time may happen that this 
distributor has the right to feed this. You can use this as a generic one. For example, like some uh, paste to formula could have uh, add. It's like an advertisement, right? Every time, number one, every time I, as the card holder, pull this out of my wallet, I think BMW. I would say. I think. I look at oh boy, I, yeah, my BMW card. Oh, I love my BMW, which I didn't, by the way. I hate that car. I hated that car. Anybody have a BMW? Hate it. You know why? You have one. You like it? You hate BMW. If I hate BMW. Back, goes back in total. No, BMWs are like designed by the 100 most brilliant engineers in the world who never talk to one another. Ow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ow. So many great ideas, but oh, how do I turn the heat on? Oh, you can push this button, you can turn this knob, you can pull this lever. I just want to turn the heat on, man. Just where's the heat? <laughs> and that's what I hated about the BMW. Anything you want to do is like, there's 4,000 ways to do it. I don't need that. Anyway, I digress. So. Every time I pull a card out of my wallet, I think BMW. More importantly, to your point, every time I pull a card out of my wallet, I'm causing other people to see the brand. The clerk at the grocery store, the person at the, uh, you know, at the restaurant, whatever. They're all seeing my little, it's like a little billboard, right? Yes, now I remember in our country, uh, when you go to a gas station, they have like a receipt money too if you don't have cash. Okay. And they says, put this money in my account and I can give you money, something like that. So I remember the gas station. On the gas, on the, oh, okay. When I put out the food. Yeah. The money from the wallet, I say, oh, the gas station does the service. They give you money if you get it. Yes. <laughs> So there you go. That was their marketing with like you. I mean, how old yeah. 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 Well, in America, you can get credit cards with pretty much any brand you want on card. Any brand you want on the card, like where I went to college, I can get that brand. Like I didn't go to Chicago and Kent, but you can get that logo on your credit card. Whatever you want, it's a big business in the United States, and there's some money in again, some money in it for BMW or whomever, but it's really a marketing motivation. Um, This is also a marketing motivation. Obviously, again, like we talked about ice cream, you know, maybe it's in a, you know, it melts, whatever. But I have this slide in here from, in, in the marketing motivation section. How does, you know what Snickers is, right? You have them yeah. there. Yeah, of course. Gotta be everywhere. Now they have ice cream, Snickers ice cream bars, which are very good in my opinion. Why, though, is this a marketing benefit to Snickers? How does this help with their brand? Forget about generating money from ice cream sales for a second. How does it help with their brand? It spreads. It spreads it, but how? It is a strategic way of including other in the chocolate, but even the ice cream. I don't know. Because it's a strategic so, part of the motivation. Yes. It's in a different place in this tour. Right. At least in the United States. I haven't been in a grocery store here yet, but it's probably the same. If I want a Snickers bar in a big grocery store, where am I going to find it? Right by the cash register, right? There's a big rack of candy bars that get my Snickers bar, and that's the only place I see the Snickers brand in the grocery store. But now that it's on ice cream, I'll also see it in the ice cream aisle. I've found in all of Europe, pretty much, that breakfast cereals are not a big thing, right? You don't eat breakfast, like cornflakes and stuff like that. You eat them? Yeah, so in, in the United States, though, in any grocery store, that's like the aisle with, it's like the biggest aisle. A whole aisle. You, you might have a, one aisle in the grocery store, and then it's got dog food over here, and diapers over here, then the cleaning supplies over here, then olive oil over there. But in America, there's an aisle, and it's just cereal, breakfast cereal, uh, corn flakes, and Rice Krispies, and Apple Jacks, and all these brands. And, and there's now also a Snickers cereal. So they're, of course, they're going to earn money from that. But the marketing motivation is not, now I don't only see the Snickers brand 
at the cash register. I see it in the ice cream aisle. I see it in the cereal aisle. To your point, it's all over the place. It's just bombarding eyeballs and spreading the brand. <coughs> Here's another one. <coughs> this is another marketing motivation. Do you know what this brand is? Uh, it's a car, right? Yeah. And in it's America, huh? American. Famous American car, but in America, this car would be like the, the brand that my grandmother would have. No young person is ever going to have a Buick. And so what they did in order to try and rejuvenate their brand was license the mark out to a sports car company, right? To manufacture Buicks, manufacture cars that have the Buick name on them, but in partnership with the sports car company as a marketing motivation to rejuvenate the brand. So this is one example where, it, even in Europe, you know, there are typically other examples. What's the brand of car that your grandmother would drive that you wouldn't? Volkswagen. Volkswagen, okay. Uh, how about, Piat. how about, Piat. Piat. You go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the cutting edge of servo-creation technology. Have you luck? The old one. So these brands, <laughs> these brands, so these brands in your part of the world are like Buick was in the United States. Something else Buick tried to do, uh, let, me, let me just see if I can bring this up on the screen. So this isn't really about a license, but this is another thing that Buick tried to do to make its brand cool again. I'm guessing this is a commercial, so we'll take 30 seconds to watch it. Not from being big. Good thing one car gives me full-size luxury. And 36 miles per gallon, which is nice because I've got shoes that are bigger than most hybrids. And more stylish, too. If you don't know the luxurious yet fuel efficient across, you don't know Buick. You get two years of premium service. All right, so in order to rejuvenate their brand and make it look like something that would be other than your grandmother would drive, they, en they enlisted this American basketball superstar. Okay. So those are. Uh, Marketing motivations. Oh, here's another one. You know what this brand is? This was, in the United States, this was the only brand of television there was when I was a kid. There wasn't, you know, there was no Sony, LG, nothing. It was only Zenith. And uh, then this brand went out of favor, and they have not been able to rejuvenate it. So trademarks can lose their protection when they get genericized, they become too popular. They can also lose their protection when they become too unpopular, right? You might, you might argue that this brand doesn't even have trademark protection anymore. All right, let me see. Okay. All right, so that's the marketing motivation. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the financial motivation. So this is probably the one that's the most obvious, right? I want to license my brand because I want to make money. Or I want to become the licensee of a brand because I want to make money. Um, and to your point, I think, who was it who said, I think it was you, like, you, uh, you would license out your brand so you wouldn't have to buy more weights for the gym, right? You could save money. So this is another company you may not recognize by name, but it's a, the company was called Spalding. They make baseball gloves, basketballs, and football pads. Uh, old, old, old American company back to the 1920s or something. And um, they decided to go from being a manufacturing company before 1980 and become a licensing company after 1980. So before 1980, they had all these factories and factory workers and trucks to deliver baseball bats. And in, that, in those times, in their last year of business, they had $273 million of revenue, 
in one year. And on that $273 million, they lost $12.5 million. So they got 273 in sales, but in order to generate that 273, they spent 285. Losing money. A successful brand from a brand new spend. Then they changed to be a licensing company. They shut down all the factories. They were like, look, we got a good brand. We know how to think about sports equipment, but we're not so great at manufacturing it and shipping it and marketing it. Let's license out the brands to somebody who does that. And in the first year after becoming a licensing company, they only had 250 million in revenue, so their revenue went down by 23 million. But on that 250 million, they had profits of 12 million. So becoming a licensing company was their financial motivation. Let's do without all of these costs. Yeah. That's one reason why the software business and the entertainment business are so can be so lucrative. They don't have those incremental costs of that you have when you're making cars or baseball gloves or tables, whatever. Because factories cost a lot of money. Machinery costs a lot of money. People cost a lot of money. So a financial motivation uh, in licensing is to avoid all those costs and just generate money. <coughs> uh, so, so it sounds like, hey, this is a great idea. Why, is it, why doesn't everyone just license? So what are the disadvantages to licensing out your intellectual property in exchange for revenue? Why would it be bad for the licensor? I've got this great brand, yeah. Maybe uh, the licensee would understand how uh, the specific product will develop and maybe sometimes he can uh, manage himself, let's say. Yeah. Not by their name, but... Oh, okay. So maybe you you uh, you the licensee gets a lot smarter, and then they leave you and become your competitor. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. You you let someone is, and that applies. I would say particularly not where you're talking about trademarks, but where you're talking about a trade secret or a patent. You train your competitors, and then they don't need you anymore. Okay. How else can it go wrong for the licensor? can stick to the sporting goods analogy. If I'm manufacturing these baseball gloves and kids love them, but I can't make money and I start licensing to you for you to run the factory and you to market the gloves, how can that turn out bad for me? Number one, you might become my competitor, right? Yeah. How else? Uh, bad quality. Bad quality. Yeah. I lose control of my brand, right? In a lot of ways. Quality control is a big one, right? If you're the licensee, especially if you're an exclusive licensee, right? You're the only one out there. I give you my brand. You do a horrible job with it. It's not like I can go out and get a new licensee because the brand will have been hurt. Okay? Or if I license to you my trade secret and you disclose the trade secret, you destroy my whole business, right? So the loss of control is risky for the licensor. I think there's another problem with, or another potential problem with the licensing model, and that is I have to collect from you, right? If I license to you my IP, and let's say it's a royalty deal, you'll pay me 20% of your net profits for exploiting, for selling these baseball gloves. Well, number one, I have to worry that you're not going to change your mind, right? Oh, and not pay me someday. I could go to court and enforce that, but that's a hassle. I have to worry that you're going to be honest with me, right? Uh, oh yeah, I sold 100 baseball gloves, so I owe you $20, whatever. But sorry, it's not uh, combined thing with uh, some facts showing... Sure, uh, with a royalty statement. But that, you know, you can lie, or you, you can be negligent or nefarious when you create, when you prepare that. And I might have an audit right, but still, as, as I'm, what I'm saying is, as licensor, that's my risk. It's a risk, yeah. And also I have to worry about whether you go bankrupt, right? There's going to be a lag time. When I was making those baseball gloves, I would take them to the store. You know, of course I'm simplifying it, right? But I would take them to the store, and the, the guy who runs the sporting goods store, I'd give him a box of gloves, he'd give me $500. Done, right? But if I'm licensing to you, the brand, and you're making the baseball gloves, 
then I got to wait for you probably until the end of the calendar quarter, reconcile your books, send me the money, and if in the interim something bad happens, you go bankrupt, I'm out all that money. So there's risk. I mean, it sounds like, hey, why wouldn't I just license and just sit back and collect the money? Well, there's risk involved. All right, now let's talk about WWE for a little bit. So you all were supposed to read the financial statements. Um, you, you all look like you had a glimmer of recognition on your faces when I said, okay, who knows what professional wrestling is. But just to get us all on the same page, make sure we're in the same frame of mind, let's watch a clip uh, that shows you what professional wrestling is. Absolutely insane. You can't help but get wrapped up. 
down and shoot down your guard and just go for the ride. All right, so as I mentioned at the very beginning of class, it's a, it's a huge business, right? Billion dollar New York Stock Exchange Company. Um, the statistics are up on the screen there. How many countries, how many different languages, how many books on the bestseller list, uh, et cetera. Um, how many of you had ever, uh, well, I'm hopeful you read that press release. In fact, now that I'm thinking aloud, maybe not everybody did, and that's gonna be an important part of the discussion. So I think what we ought to do is, well, how many of you have ever read a, a, a publicly traded company earnings press release like that before? Yeah, not many, right? Uh, but every, and let me ask you this. In your countries, do you have public reporting like that of companies' financial information? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. We have a no, we we have this no interest for it. The one when we will have a case. Just the one when you have a case. Yeah, we'll have yeah. for the, for the public reporting dollars. like that? Stop the publication? Yes. Even yeah, with the radio, so twice a day you have to It's required by law for a company to disclose twice a day? No, on radio it is. Okay. They, they do this. They do this on radio. Oh, okay. so it's like a... It's, it's for the radio. For example, we have Antenna 5. Some companies that are on the stock exchange market, they, sh they have obligation to publish their... Uh, reports. Their reports. Yeah. Annual reports. But, what about the radio thing? That's just, that's not a requirement by law, right? No company is required two times no, a day. No, no, no. It's no, just, I do it. yes, okay, all right. Okay. Times a day? Uh, right. Oh, it's just, uh, it's a news report. Here's what the stock price is for this company right now. Yeah, yeah. we do that too. Okay, so in, in many uh, countries that aren't as developed, but they don't have as developed a legal system as the United States, the stock market and the reporting requirements are not taken as seriously as they are in the United States. But in the US, if you wanna be a publicly traded company where the general public can buy and sell your stock, you have to report your financial information publicly, both in a spreadsheet form and in this format with the, you know, the narrative that's easier to read four times a year, right? Every calendar quarter. And, uh, huh? Yeah. Once a year. Yeah, it's, written law, it's written in law. Right, and that's the purpose of it. You know, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people don't have interest in it. But if you're an investor, you want to look at the financial information to see whether you want to invest, whether buy the stock or sell the stock if you already own it, right? All right, so let's, uh, let's mix this break with an opportunity for you to refresh your recollection about the press release or to read it for the first time if you didn't read it in preparation. <coughs> Basically, when we come back from the break, what we're going to talk about is, all right, for every category of revenue in this press release, what comes from IP licensing and what does not come from IP licensing. So we're going to see, like, of the billion dollars a year that WWE generates in revenue, how much comes from licensing. That's going to be our goal after the break. So take a 10-minute break, and we'll come back and talk about the press release.